you all to bow your heads and close your eyes as we prepare now for God's word. If you all just take a moment. Too often we don't take time to be silent before the Lord. Especially as his people gathered. Would you just allow the Lord to just still your heart for a moment? Father, go before us now. Prepare our hearts to hear your word. And Lord, that goes first and foremost for myself. Father, I ask that you would fill me, empower me with your spirit. May your word be so clearly heard and understood. May the gospel be so clear. Father, I pray that you'll save a lost soul here today that needs to know Jesus Christ as his or her Lord and Savior. I pray that you would prepare us now to hear your word, to be ready to be doers of your word. Father, be glorified through your word. Be heard, be exalted. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You know, whenever I meet someone for the first time, I like to always ask a question in our conversation. And one of the questions that I usually ask is, hey, where are you from? Are you originally from here? And the reason why I do that is I want to try to make a connection with those I first meet. And sometimes I'm able to find out that a person might be from a, a place that I once visited, perhaps a place that I actually lived. Often I'll hear someone give this answer. I was in a military family, or I was an army brat. And of course, the person who says that, what they're saying is, I lived in so many places, it's hard for me to say that I'm actually from one place. It's hard for me to say that there is one place that I'm really from. And you know, we could almost say that a, a military family is almost a, a, a modern pilgrim, if you will. And I have a burden as we remember our troops, and I encourage you to keep praying for our military. Hey, you need to be praying for the military families as well. And these families, again, up and move at a moment's notice, and they receive an order to go and to move wherever it is that they might be commanded to go. They're modern pilgrims, if you will. And you know, in the same way, when you and I come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we come and we say, Lord, I am a sinner. I know that you're the only one who can take away my sin. That moment we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, we too enter into a pilgrimage. This life of faith. Oftentimes it's so wonderful and joyful. And other times it's hard. Other times it is tough to walk this pilgrimage. And this morning we're going to study the first pilgrim, if you will, who entered this life of faith. And we're going to read his story this morning in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, if you want to look on with me, I'll be in Genesis 12 this morning. You know, we've been in this series I've titled The Faith Factor. And as I share with you from day one, you know, I believe that one of the biggest losses, one of the biggest needs in the church today, man, is real faith. I mean, it's hard to find those in the church today, I'm talking in churches in general, Man, you got people who just say, you know what, that's a tough situation, that's impossible, but I serve a big God. My God's bigger than that problem. My God is bigger than that situation. And we start from the very beginning, we, we looked at what the Bible said, what is faith? We defined it from the Bible. Then we also had to talk about saving faith. Because as I said in that sermon, hey, you and I can't talk about faith unless we truly understand saving faith. I mean, folks, we can't have a conversation until you and I have gotten things right with Jesus Christ. Understand that you and I are sinners, we have fallen short of God's glory, and God in his mercy has sent his son to reconcile us to God. Without Christ, we are hopeless. We are, we are destined for eternal hell apart from Christ. We also talked about being a faith champion. We looked at Elijah. I mean, there was Elijah with this confidence before God. But what we haven't talked about is what does it mean to live out faith? What does it mean faith living, to live a life of faith? What does it look like on a daily basis, a week to week, month to month, year to year basis? Well, there was a man God called in faith in Genesis. Now, to talk about Genesis chapter 12, I got to back up into Genesis chapter 11 for a moment. These mics are getting in my way this morning. It's all right. Back in Genesis chapter 11, there's a genealogy as you finish the chapter, and it's easy to overlook some of the names in there. 
the Lord mentions the generations of a man named Terah, and he lists the sons of Terah. He became the father of some men named Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And it says that Haran became the father of Lot. But in there, it's easy to overlook a very important name, a very important figure that God is going to use to fulfill his promise, to fulfill his blessing, to reconcile the world. And it's going to start with this man, a man named Abram, who the Lord renames later on as Abraham. And we see that he calls Abram to this life of faith. He is the first pilgrim. He is the first one that actually puts into practice faith living. And as we study Abram's life this morning, I want us to see, hey, what does it mean to live a life of faith? I mean, how do you and I live this out on a day-to-day basis? What does faith living look like? Well, let's start first. I want to look in Genesis chapter 12. Let's look in verses 1 to 3 as we understand what faith living is. Genesis 12, beginning verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives And from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All right, so when it comes to faith living, I want you to notice with me, number one, notice first the call to step out. Notice first the call to step out. Hey, there is a call to step out. Notice that Abraham is called to step out on faith there. Now, when we're first introduced to Abram, he's a nobody. I mean, he's an unknown. He's rather living in obscurity. The Bible says that he's living in this land of, from Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, the Ur of the Chaldeans is what we know today as modern Iraq. Uh, much of the Gulf War in 1991 was fought in this region and area that Abram was from. Now, we're not told how Abram was called by the Lord. All we know here is that the Lord says to him, hey, Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house In other words, he says, hey, Abram, step out. Step out on faith. And he calls Abram to leave his region, his relatives, his religion. Man, to leave it all behind. He says, Abram, go, step out. Now, why did the Lord pick this one man over all the men in the inhabited earth at that time? I mean, of all the human beings that God could have called, why did he call Abram? We don't know. But what we do know is this. When he called Abram, he was no more famous, no more gifted, no more skilled or better than any of us here. And God called him to step out on faith. And when we say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me for my sin. I know that you and you alone can take away my sin because of you going to the cross and conquering death, folks. You and I then make a commitment to enter this pilgrimage, to enter this life of faith. And you and I say, Lord, hey, whatever it is you want me to do, Lord, I am yours. It's like a pastor I once heard say, hey, we just give God a blank check. We say, Lord, I am yours. Here's my check. Fill it out. Sign it. Put in the amount, Lord. Whatever it is, I am yours. And folks, that's what it means to live a life of faith. When you and I come to trust Jesus Christ, we have this call to step out on faith. You know, Jesus himself told his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, his call is for every believer to leave the old behind and step out in faith to the new. And listen to those promises that he gave Abram. Listen to these. He promised him a new home. He promised him many offspring. He promised him great blessings. He promised Abram a great name. He said that Abram will be a blessing, that God will protect him from his enemies, that God will bless his friends, and that all the world will be blessed through Abram's faith. Wow. I mean, those are great blessings. But the journey was not going to be easy. 
There are going to be times when he's not going to be able to see the way. There's going to be times where he's just going to have to step out and step out on faith, not by sight. And folks, the same goes for you and I. In this faith journey, hey, there's going to be times you and I won't see the way. Man, there's going to be times we're going to say, hey, hey Lord, what, what can you do with this circumstance? Lord, what can you do with my family? What can you do with this situation? I don't know. And there's going to be times when you and I must walk by faith and not by sight as well. And folks, there's some people that can't do that. There are some people that say, hey, I have to see it to believe it. I've got to see it to understand it. But folks, let me tell you, folks, the people that God uses greatly are those who will walk obedient wherever the path God leads them to. Did you hear that? The people that God uses greatly are those who will walk obediently wherever the path of God leads them to. And folks, let me tell you something. Those are the people that get to see the Lord part the seas. Those are the ones that get to see the Lord feed the multitudes. Those are the ones who get to walk on water. Those are the ones who go through the fiery furnaces of life and the lion's dens and are untouched, unburned, and not eaten. They live by faith and they get to see the Lord do the great, the impossible, the unbelievable again and again and again. And it starts with this call to step out. All right, now look with me. Let's go on God's word. Let's walk through the text. Verses 4 through 6 now. Genesis 12. Let's begin in verse 4. And so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. All right, here's the second point I want you to see about faith living. Notice, secondly, number two, the cause to step up. Notice, secondly, the cause to step up. There's a cause for him to step up here. In other words, Abram's got work to do. Abram's got to work on God's plan that's set before him. All right, so notice what it says there again in verse 4. It says, so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Man, he did exactly what the Lord told him to do, didn't he? I mean, here it is, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord says, go, verse 4, Abram does what? Abram went. Man, he obeyed. The Lord told him to do something, he did it. And folks, let me tell you something. Man, there's amazing power. Man, there's amazing victory when we hear God's voice, but we go beyond that and we actually obey and do what he tells us to do. Now, some of you may know that I'm a lifelong Dallas Cowboys fan. I don't want to hear any comments. My parents are from Oklahoma. My dad was born and raised a Cowboys fan. I was born into being a Cowboys fan. And of all the NFL players that have ever existed, my favorite player, above all, is none other than Roger Staubach. I don't care that Joe Montana won four Super Bowls. I don't care Terry Bradshaw won four Super Bowls. I don't care that Marino and Elway and those guys and Favre have those records. I don't care. Staubach, in my eyes, is the greatest player of all time. One of the factors about Roger Staubach was he played for the great Tom Landry, and Landry called all the plays. And he expected Roger to implement the plays exactly how Coach Landry told him to. Coach Landry told him to run, he better run. Coach Landry told him to throw, he better throw. If he changed the play, he better be right about it. Well, this caused some contention and some dissension between Roger and, and Coach Landry till finally Staubach said this, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony fulfillment and victory in that time period Roger Staubach's career the Cowboys won more games than any other team in the NFL during that time period hey folks here's my point man when we obey what the Lord tells us to do we too will see fulfillment man we will see harmony we will see victory we will see God's hand in a mighty way Abram stepped out he stepped up he stepped up in faith he risked it all He put his mouth where his money was. 
It's easy to say we have faith. Hey, I've got a lot of faith. Hey, I'll do whatever the Lord wants us to do. Hey, would you really? You know, I remember when I, I packed up everything and heeded God's call to, to ministry. I, I packed up my car and I, I drove out to Texas. And I'll tell you, folks, that was a lot easier then than it would be now. Well, with a wife and kids, it would be a, sh- a whole lot harder today than that. But I'll tell you something. I, mean, I saw men who were married with kids. And they packed it up. They left it all behind. Careers, jobs, family. To say, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm going, Lord. I'm stepping out. I'm stepping up. And folks, it's not about being called a ministry. That's what the basic is for us in the Christian life. I mean, for you and I to say that we're Christians, hey, we, we trust Jesus Christ, folks, that's the, the, the bare minimum. Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, we are called to step out. We are called to step up. Hey, remember Peter, Matthew 14? Remember, he's in the boat with all the disciples, and they see Jesus walking on the water. Man, they're, they're, and the Bible says they were terrified, and they were frightened. And Jesus gives them that great reassurance, doesn't he? He says, hey, do not fear, it is I. Remember what Peter says to him? He says, Lord, okay, if it is you, then command me to come out to the water to you. And Jesus says what? He says, come. Now, Peter had a choice. I mean, there it was laid before him. Hey, Peter, come. The Lord told Abram, go. What did Peter do? Matthew 14, verse 29. Listen to this. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Hey, folks, Peter got to do what very few have ever gotten to do. I mean, how many of us here have got to say we've walked on water? I haven't. And yet Peter heard that call. He heard the Lord's voice. Hey, come, Peter, get out of the boat. He had a choice. He got out. He stepped up. Hey, living this life of faith, folks, called out, step out, also to step up. All right, but there's a third point I want to show you now. Look in verse 7. Look with me now. Let's move through the text. Genesis 12, verses 7 to 12, 10 now. Look in verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram, and he said, To your descendants I will give this land. And so he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. All right, third and final point I want you to notice. In this faith living, notice third and finally, the charge to stay in. Notice the charge to stay in. Man, he was given a charge to stay in living this life of faith. The Lord gave him this great promise, didn't he? He says, to your descendants, I will give this land. The Lord gave him this promise. But think about that. He's saying, hey, to your descendants, I'm going to give this land. You know what he was really saying to Abram? Hey, Abram, you're not going to live to see this. Hey, Abram, I've got a great blessing, and guess what? Your children's 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 going to see it, and you're not. Lord, what kind of reward is that? I mean, he had a choice. He learned a lesson there. Hey, wait a second. I I stepped out. Lord, isn't that enough? I I stepped up. Lord, isn't that enough? You see, living this life of faith causes us to stay in, to stay in the task and understand, folks, that we're going to continue having to step out and to step up there. So what do you do? Well, it says there that he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. In other words, Abram worshipped. He worshipped, but he didn't finish there. He proved he was staying in. He proved that he was going to stay in this faith journey. How do we know that? Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel. Now notice verse 9. Abram journeyed on. He journeyed on. He kept on going. He stayed in. I had an old friend who used to say, hey, you got to keep on keeping on. Well, that's what Abram did. He says, Lord, I'm not going to see this, but I'm going to keep trusting you. And folks, what a reminder to you and I that this life journey, 
Living this life of faith, folks, it's not about here and now. Even after we pass on, whenever that day comes, it's about the descendants to come. It's about the generations to come. You and I got a responsibility to prepare the next generation to do whatever it is, Lord, to continue your work. Lord, I'm willing to do whatever it is you want us to do, Lord, in order for you to continue to further your kingdom to the generations to come. But I want you to notice two quick facts before we close this morning about Abram's journey here, all right? He stayed in the journey, but I want you to notice two facts very quickly. First, he was tested. Hey, he stayed in this faith journey, folks, but he was tested. Look in verse 10 for a moment. Verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. All right, so a devastating famine, man, sends Abram and his family down to Egypt. Now, at that time, if a famine came in, you had to find water. I mean, this was the time before the modern navigation system days. And so it was very common in that region, the Nile River being as long as it was, could provide water for for drinking, for animals, for the vegetation, to grow crops. He had a test. And Abram learned a very, very valuable lesson in this school of faith. Folks, after a great triumph, there will be tests. Hey, it's not going to be easy. Tests are going to come your way and my way. The, the Lord never tempts us, but he does test us. Hey, the Lord says in Isaiah 48, verse 10, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. You see, folks, real faith living will involve real tests. They're going to come. They're going to come to you and to me. And not going to be a one and done deal. They're going to come again and again and again. But I'll show you another lesson, though, that Abram had to learn. Notice also, folks, look in verses 11 to 16 with me real quick. Last passage here in this chapter. Genesis 12, 11 to 16. It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. And please say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Verse 14. It came about when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore, he treated Abram well for her sake and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. All right, so when he got there, he told Sarai, hey, listen to me. Don't tell him you're you're my wife. Tell him you're my sister. It was kind of a half-truth. I mean, she was his half-sister, but you well know as well as I do what, that a half-truth is what? is a full lie, isn't it? It's exactly what he did. He had his first failure, and here's the lesson we learn here. Hey, Abram failed along the way. In this faith journey, he failed. He failed along the way. Now, I want you to notice something about that previous verse in verse 10. It says there in verse 10, Now, there was a famine in the land, so Abram went. Doesn't say there was a famine in the land, so Abram called upon the Lord. Doesn't say there was a famine in the land, so, the Lord, so Abram sought the Lord. Hey, Lord, there's a famine. What should I do? He just went. He went. He lied. And, and knowing that he was a foreigner in a foreign land, he was going to have no rights. He was already starting to contemplate in his head, well, hey, well, somebody's going to take advantage of me. They might even try to kill me because my wife's so beautiful. Hey, well, just, just, just say I, I'm your brother and, and, hey, they'll treat me good. They'll treat you good. Everything will be all right. And he failed along the way. He stopped seeking the Lord first. He stopped trusting the Lord's guidance and plan, and he committed his first failure. But was that the end of the story? I mean, was Abram's story ended there? Was it all done with for Abram no we don't have time but when you continue on in the book of Genesis you'll see that despite this failure despite this disobedience 
God continued to walk with Abram as he continued to step out on faith. God continued to walk with him as Abram stepped out on faith, and the greatest blessings were realized later on. The greatest promises were realized later on. You see, folks, here's the good news. Hey, you and I will be tested in this life of faith. We say, Lord, I'm going to stay in this. I'm going to stay with it. The tests are going to come, and the failures are going to come. Hey, you're going to fail. I'm going to fail. I've failed. you failed. We've all failed, folks. It's going to come. But here's the good news. It doesn't change the fact that we serve a faithful God. Because it's nothing about us. It's all about Him. Living a life of faith, folks, causes us to understand, hey, we are called to step out, to step up, and to stay in. Understanding that we might even see the blessings God promises even beyond our time. But He's faithful, and He requires this of us. If we stay in the task, we're going to see God's hand and God's might and favor like we just will not believe at all. Hey, we all just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And with all heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you something this morning. Is there something that the Lord is calling you to step out on? Is there something in your life the Lord is saying without a doubt so clearly, hey, I'm calling you to go. I'm calling you to do. I'm calling you to take action. Hey, what's your answer? What's the next step? Are you contemplating about stepping up? Hey, maybe perhaps you you stepped out on faith before. Maybe your answer is, Lord, hey, I did step out for you once. Lord, I showed my faithfulness to you. Maybe the Lord's reminding you and I Hey, the journey's not done. I've got more for you to step out on. I've got more for you to step up on. I've got more for you to stay in this journey I've called you to. And folks, when we disobey God, that's sin. Perhaps this morning we need to come before him and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for not stepping out. Lord, forgive me for staying safe. Lord, forgive me for playing it safe. The good news is that our Lord is full of compassion, forgiveness, when we humble ourselves before him. And it all starts by humbling ourselves before him in salvation. Understanding that that we are sinners. We are soaked with sin. We can't help it. Our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, and our sins separate us from holy, perfect, almighty God. And there's nothing in our power that can get us right with God again. No amount of church attendance, no amount of Bible reading, no amount of praying, but it's all about what God has done. He's taken it upon himself to send the only price that can be paid for our sin, to send the perfect, blameless, spotless Lamb of God, his own Son. And Jesus came in this world, lived a perfect life. He went on a cross to shed his blood, to pay for your sin and my sin. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again on the third day, conquering death, allowing anyone to call upon him in faith to have eternal life. Hey, perhaps you might be saved. Maybe you need to go to the cross again, ask forgiveness, get refined again, renewed reminded that God has called you on this faith journey to live this life of faith day to day week by week, month to month, year to year what is it you need to come before him this morning and perhaps there is some disobedience you need to ask God's forgiveness for as Tamara said earlier we've got these crosses here in the sanctuary, you can just come this morning perhaps there's a sin you need to just write down and just nail it to the cross hey nobody's going to ever see that I assure you, whatever you put there, it's going to stay between you and the Lord. Maybe there's another decision that God's leading on your heart this morning to make. Would you listen to his voice? Would you obey him? Would you step out? Would you step up? Would you stay in? Father God, you're so awesome. We thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. When I have failed you again and again and again, 
and knowing that I'm going to fail you again and again and again, that you still love me, you still offer your forgiveness and your grace, not because of who I am or how good I am. It's all about Jesus because I am no good, Lord. I'm a sinner who's only saved by the blood and grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, would you move in a mighty way? Would you just stir hearts, move your people to come up, save the souls that need to be saved, restore the relationship that need to be restored, Father, and get those journeys aligned again of those you're calling to step out on faith for your glory. Father, be glorified now as we respond to you in Jesus Christ's name.